So in three, two. Good afternoon. I now call to order the meeting of the Curriculum Committee for Thursday, October the 21st, 2021. In accordance with the Board of Education's amended resolution approved at the October 13th, 2020 board meeting in the event of a medical or health emergency related to COVID-19, the board chair in consultation with the vice chair and the superintendent may declare that a board meeting or a board committee meeting be held remotely in its entirety without the physical presence of board members or in a hybrid manner with only some individual board members participating remotely, subject to the establishment of a mechanism that would allow each board member the opportunity to fully participate in the meeting despite not being physically present, and that would allow the public to also remotely attend those portions of the meeting that are open pursuant to the Maryland Open Meetings Act by being able to listen and or view those portions of the meeting. As a result, today's curriculum committee meeting is being held virtually and broadcasted through a Microsoft Teams live event. Links can be found on the BCPS website and on board docs. In order to efficiently conduct this meeting, all voting items this afternoon will be done by a roll call vote. Board members will say their names before making and seconding a motion as applicable as well as when requesting discussion on an agenda item. Ms. Cox, please call the roll uh, to determine the presence of a quorum of the committee. Ms. Pastor. Present. Mr. Offerman. Present. Ms. Smack. Present. Mr. Thomas. Here. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Cox, please call the role of staff members participating in today's meeting. Dr. McComas. Present. Dr. Whitstead. Present. Dr. Emmendorf. Present. Dr. Perandozzi. Present. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Will you please call and note the names of all staff members Oh, oh, yeah, that's what you did. Um, well, you see if there are other staff members or board members who are also present on this call. I see board member Miss Joes. Good afternoon, yes. Miss Joes. And I also yeah. um, staff member Miss Stansberry. Miss Stansberry, welcome. And Mr. Stovenauer. And Mr. Stovenauer, welcome. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you, Ms. Cox. Uh, we remember that uh, we will facilitate this meeting uh, by uh, having me call the names of committee members to speak in turn and please give your name when you are speaking. With that being said, I think we are ready to begin. That being said, just let me open the agenda. Again, I want to welcome and thank everyone as um, Dr. McComas indicated somewhere during, during this meeting, she will have to leave and Dr. Wistead will be serving as our staff person in charge. So thank you, Dr. McComas and Dr. Wistead. That being said, I'm right now going to turn this over to Dr. McComas. Thank you so much, Ms. Pastor and members of the committee. So we will get started uh, today's agenda with I items for approval. Um, as always, we try to bring forward um, presentations so that you understand what are materials that you will see in upcoming contracts committee. I will say our very first item, and Dr. Perandozzi, please correct me if I am in uh, wrong on this. Our first item um, that we thought we were going to discuss temporary adult assistance and therapeutic behavioral aids has actually been moved um, in terms of its schedule and so we should be bringing that next month. Is that correct Dr. Per Perandozzi? Um, it is correct that it has been moved but it has been moved until December we were advised. Okay, that's excellent. And so we will bring that back in the November curriculum committee. Okay, let me make sure I have this. I'm gonna keep my own notes. So what was number two, temporary adult assistance and therapeutic behavior aids will be in December 
Is that it will correct? go to contracts in December, and so it will be in curriculum committee in November. It'll be in curriculum in November. Yes, ma'am. Contracts in December. OK, and I so, do appreciate that. That was just a change that I just found out. Um, otherwise, I would have corrected that sooner. So thank you. Okay. Um, so our next item up is Kurzweil, and this is actually a, an item that's not brand new. This is something that has been um, already in use in Baltimore County for some time. Um, and so I'm going to invite Dr. Elmendorf and Mr. Stovenauer and our team to just uh, walk through what is Kurzweil? Why do we uh, need it uh, for our students and uh, I'll turn it over and uh, ask you to get started. All right, thank you Dr. McComas. Yes, we are excited to talk to you about uh, Kurzweil today. This isn't a new contract like Dr. McComas said. It's more a change in vendor. We'll be working directly with um, Kurzweil rather than Envision since Envision is no longer uh, in business. And Kurzweil is one of the most reputable digital tools in the ed tech space for sure. I remember when we uh, first started using Kurzweil 16 years ago in BCPS and we could only use it with students for whom its use was designated on their IEP. And, and back then it was a matter of installing it and uninstalling it on computers using a CD-ROM. Um, Mr. Thomas, I'm not sure if you remember what a CD-ROM is or you were around when that, that happened, but um, <laughs> I remember I was teaching an undergraduate in, un, instructional technology course actually at Towson University at the time in which we spent several weeks talking about assistive tech. And one of my students said something like, Kurzweil is such a great tool. Everyone really could benefit from it. Why are we only allowed to use it with, with students who have um, IEPs? And I remember thinking that only allowed in students with specific learning disabilities to access Kurzweil was like only allowing people with wheelchairs to access the curb cuts on sidewalks. My twins were actually infants at the time and as a dad with no sleep pushing a double stroller down the street, I can remember the euphoria I would experience when I saw a curb cut. It meant I didn't have to lift up the front of the stroller and risk waking up Chloe so that she would then cry and wake up Cole. So the curb cut was designed to assist specifically with wheelchairs, but it was also helpful for strollers, scooters, bikes, or just anyone who was having trouble getting up onto the curb. So fortunately, we're at a place in the spirit of Universal Design for Learning or UDL that Kurzweil is accessible to all of our teachers and all of our students. In fact, we're able to access a system-wide license for the price of what it would cost to buy individual licenses for just 140 individuals. So while not everyone uses Kurzweil, like not everyone uses curb cuts, I think it's safe to say that 140 of the 111,000 students and 7,000 teachers are making use of this important tool. And so with that, I am gonna turn it over to uh, Mr. Stovenauer to give you some more specific information. Thank you, Dr. Elmendorf. Uh, it's nice to talk to you folks again, and thank you for letting us come in. Um, Kurzweil 3000 is a district-wide tool that is primarily used by our students with IEPs and 504 plans that require text tools and study tools uh, through their IEP or their 504 plan to ensure their access to the curriculum and to assessments. Uh, it's been available to our students for 16 years, as Dr. Elmendorf said, um, but now it is available to all students through their web browser and through their computers. Um, and while there are some other tools out there that have some of these features independently, uh, we believe that Kurzweil offers the most comprehensive suite of tools that many of our students require. Uh, by making Kurzweil available for all of our students, BCPS continues to its focus on universal design for learning. And in the past, this tool was also the only approved text accommodation for standardized testing, such as the HSA, which led to its widespread implementation. Uh, next slide, please. Actually, uh, two slides. Thank you. So uh, BCPS has provided several supporting documents for Kurzweil, many of which are available through the Innovation Hub uh, and in resources in Schoology for staff, both video and step-by-step -step guides. Um, however, when a student requires this support as part of the accommodations outlined in the IEP or 504, the assistive technology team steps in and provides training for teachers and ongoing supports for students. Next slide, please. So, who benefits? Our students that have learning disabilities, including dyslexia and dysgraphia, visual impairments, uh, developmental disabilities, uh, a, a plethora of different issues that we need to address uh, through our, our individualized supports. Um, and teachers can provide these materials in this format for any student. So this would be a digital tool um, that we provide 
uh, that we can use to enhance what's being delivered to students uh, in a variety of formats. Next slide, please. Um, it involves, uh, Kurzweil has a lot of reading features, so provide access to the curriculum through lots of different approaches, um, text to speech in over 18 languages. Um, it does have a PDF reader, which is important for our, um, our accessibility requirements that we have for students. Uh, a lot of other tools do not have a PDF reader. They will do text to speech, but, but have trouble with PDF. Um, it has the American Heritage Picture and Talking Dictionaries already built in. Um, you can customize it to students' different reading rates. Um, obviously, text magnification. Again, a lot of these tools are in different in other platforms, but not in a comprehensive model like this. Um, the, the Read the Web feature uh, is vital to our students. It, it exists both uh, in their browser and then also Kurzweil works very well with Schoology. Next slide, please. Uh, then it's not just about reading tools. So it has comprehension and study tools features. The study tools features, I can tell you on a personal note, uh, come in very handy when you're working with students um, and they need lots of different annotation guides or highlighters, um, different study guides that can be available for them that, that are just at the ready. Um, and again, also translation of words and passages. It can translate up to 70 different languages. Um, and that is in addition to those 18 that it can read in. Next slide, please. Uh, again, moving forward, it also has writing tool features. So uh, you can use uh, graphic organizers, templates, outlining templates that are in there, um, spell check uh, as part of the, the suite. Um, it will do word prediction and it also does speech to text. So if you have students that have um, uh, the need in their IEP or their 504 to have dictation, uh, Kurzweil can do that uh, as part of its platform. Finally, I believe uh, last slide. So in summary, just Kurzweil offers us a whole host of things in one place. And while um, it is not uh, readily used in every single classroom, again, it's been pushed because of the, uh, the need for our students with uh, IEPs and 504s that have it in their, in their plans. Um, and again, we provide that support when it is, is necessary for a student, but given universal design for learning, it allows us to have it available to all students. Um, we believe the cost effectiveness of the district wide access is very important. Um, we, we have to provide a tool like this for students uh, who require it. Um, so not renewing it will not eliminate the need for it, but we want to avoid creating a gap for those students. Um, implementation is improved uh, across the board when teachers are able to use it as a support for multiple students. Um, the big issue we had previously was that licensing seat by seat, um, and we don't have that issue now when it's available for everyone. And again, I've said this before, many other tools offer some of the pieces of this suite, but not as a comprehensive tool. So um, with that, I'll end that, that part of it. And if there's any questions, Dr. Delmendorf and I can, can do our best to answer those. Thank you so much for that presentation. I've been looking forward to this presentation on Kurzweil, so thank you. I loved um, uh, Dr. Elmendorf, your beginning with the um, just comparing it to trying to go down the handicap ramp, ramp and the strollers because these are the kinds of things I've always felt, and particularly about Kurzweil boys, some of the things that are used for our children who have learning, uh, diagnosed learning disabilities would be just so wonderful if we could use them for other children um, who have similar needs, but they don't have the IEP, et cetera, but they need some of these skills. So I've been looking forward to this. So thank you, Ms. Mack. I think Mr. Offerman was first. Okay, Mr. Offerman was I'm yes. looking at the hands that came up. All right, so uh, Mr. Offerman and then Ms. Mack. Okay. Uh, first of all, this sounds like a really, a really great tool. Uh, my concern is, is there a specific need for teacher training, and uh, and uh, if 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 uh, and if so, is that planned at this point, or 
or or is it already ongoing? Uh, I can I can speak to the ongoing nature of it. This is uh, where our assistive tech team really comes into play. So when a student is uh, when when Kurzweil is recommended as part of the IEP, or let me let me rephrase that, when the supports in the IEP would would need something like Kurzweil, so uh, speech to text or text to speech or or some of those study tools. The, assist, the assistive technology team will step in there and do some training both with the teacher and the student in how to use them. And also part of their ongoing support is then teaching the, the instructor how to use that throughout their entire classroom. Um, and so we do it that way. And anyone else who's interested in it through the Innovation Hub and the supports that the, um, the Office of, of Educational Technology has developed, we have lots of um, videos and, and support materials available to teachers that would want to use that. But I think specifically to your question, do we have a district-wide plan for training folks in this? It's been around for a long time. And, and again, it started as that um, specific need for IEP and 504 students. So there's no district-wide plan, but but certainly the availability and the more people that use it, the more people start to implement it throughout their, their classroom spaces. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And I would, I would just add that being new to this position and somebody who's very familiar with this tool and has, has taught others how to use it, um, it is one of my goals to build an awareness that this exists and what it's capable of doing for those students who may not have it as part of their IEP. So, for example, one way that I've used it is that you can actually, for self-regulation when you're writing, you can use it in, well, while you're typing, you can speak at the same time and it helps you to regulate what you're, what you're typing. So you might say here, but type her and Kurzweil will help you switch your her to a here, which is what you originally wanted and that's what you originally stated audibly. Let me just, if I may just add real quickly. Um, first, I want to say thank you, Mr. Offman. As, and as always, our committee is very thoughtful about trying to make sure that our professionals have training and have professional learning and have access. So we will take back, um, certainly as one of our follow on actions, how do we increase awareness and access to training? And it could look like a multitude of things like self direct, like um, self-narrated PowerPoints that we can push out. So I think it, it is a worthy point for us to revisit and refresh. How do we ensure that our professionals are aware and know how to utilize this resource on behalf of kids, um, not just students with IEPs, but um, certainly those we know get this, the targeted specific training um, because um, over time you have, you know, people come into the organization who may not uh, have the awareness. So I just want to say uh, we will definitely take that back and we appreciate it. It's, it's an example of how this has been with us so long that we've taken that for granted. So we will make sure that we address that moving forward. I want to thank you for that, Dr. McComas, because mm -hmm. I'm very familiar with it, but now we're, we're taking a new step with it. But I can assure uh, Mr. Offerman and anyone else, if I figured it out way back and was able to use it, it's it really isn't difficult, but it's important because he brought up the question and we, we want to make sure that folks understand that this is not something that's not achievable, not attainable, and I'm talking about for staff. So yes, going it, back and embracing that and first making people aware that this very comprehensive um, program is available for them and that it is something that can be very easily hands-on for them. So that's that's great because it has been around for a while and people may have in their heads for a long time that it doesn't, it's not for them. It's not what they can use and do. Right, right. And it is intuitive. So thank you so much for that opportunity. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thomas, do you have any questions? Uh, I do, but I don't believe Ms. Mack has gone yet. And I know that she was before me. Oh, you know what, Ms. Mack? You're so right. We were still on Mr. Offerman. And I jumped right in there. Go ahead, Ms. Mack. So I would like to thank Mr. Offerman for bringing up the issue that he brought up because on May 20th, I sent an email to the curriculum committee talking about my concern that this year alone, we have introduced 10 new programs. Most of them are acceleration and remediation programs and that we had at least five other programs like Orton Gillingham letters, ongoing bridges training, ongoing open court 
um, that we had not accomplished having all teachers trained. Um, I understand that um, Kurzweil is rather intuitive, but Sunday night I reached out to some teachers and asked them to reach out to some teachers with just an open-ended question. How do you use Kurzweil? And by Monday, I had a lot of responses telling me that people don't use it. Um, to what Dr. Elmendorf said, teachers who have been around a while remember when we used Kurzweil because we had students could only take tests using Kurzweil, but um, MCAP and HSA have built in assessment platforms now that don't require that. And I am concerned that we have to encourage teachers to use something that has been around for 16 years when they've obviously created some workarounds. And my other concern is this is not a cheap product. I went back and pulled the contracts um, in a board meeting on October 10, 2017. We looked at a con well, not we because I wasn't here. I don't think um, the board looked at a contract that had been previously approved on October 23rd, 2007. The initial spending authority was 480,000. The request that ultimately got approved was for an additional million dollars in spending authority. Um, and I believe to date at that point in time, the expenditures, the total contractual expenditures were $605,000. I have a concern of number one of spending money. The only teachers I could find who used it were teachers where the child's IEP specifically stated Kurzweil and did not state some general text to speech or it, um, it specifically stated that it needed Kurzweil for organizing ideas. Um, I before I would vote for this contract, I would like to see some usage data because again, I don't think we can continue to spend this money. It, to me, if it's such a great product, teachers would be using it and we would not have to encourage them to use it. And having a $480,000 initial spending authority, and, and my other question about that, that end date was through October 31st, 2027. So why are we even talking about the contract six years before the contract extension date? Right, so I can share with you. Let me. I'm sorry. Let me just uh, interject here for a moment. Um, first, thank you, Miss Mac, for that. As always, um, for um, helping us really look at details. Um, I will say it is coming. It's here today, and you'll see it in the contracts committee. Not because we are requesting spending authority. Not because we're modifying the contract. It is a name change of the vendor. So it's really, and we brought it here um, to make sure, because you know, I always want to make sure that you as committee members have the courtesy of knowing what's coming up and, and what those products are, what those resources are. Um, and so this is not coming forward to contracts for a change in um, those terms. It's just coming because the, the name of the vendor has shifted. And Doug, if you can, uh, I think you mentioned that, but uh, if there's anything and, and he did, I apologize. I did hear that. No, that's okay. That's okay. That's all yeah, right. Envision, Envision went out of business basically, basically, so we're working directly with Kurzweil now. Right. And, I'm sorry. You did say that, but Dr. McComas, I guess my, at this point, having talked, I'm sorry, my home phone's ringing. That, no worries. Um, having spoken to so many teachers about this, yeah. I, I would like to ask that, and you, you know, I know we do this periodically, yeah. is look at what's really happening yeah. and, and, I, I, you said that we are going to a system wide license, but if people are really not using it and they're using things like um, uh, some people use Schoology, although some teachers said that's geez, who is? I'm sorry, somebody really wants to talk to me. <laughs> um, they, some teachers say that Schoology is a little clunky, mm -hmm. but other teachers have said um, that they use the read write extension in Google Apps mm -hmm. and I would just like us to look at it because sure. again, a million four eighty is a lot of money if teachers really aren't using it. And again, if it's an intuitive product that teachers know are going to help them help students, they would be using it and our data would show that. Sure. So okay, I but, uh, Dr. McComas, before you jump in, 
Yes, ma'am. As a schoolhouse person, very recently, let me jump in and having been an administrator. Um, Miss Mack, the same person who was calling you must be calling me now. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> Important ladies, that's for All sure. All right. So I just we I nipped that in the bud for both of us. Okay. Well, I don't know how to do it on my home phone, but I just did it on my phone. <laughs> okay. Well, we just knocked them out. Um, I just want to say that what first of all is put over here and on this side that it's about the name change for us for today. But going to Ms. Max's real question, um, I have talked about Kurzweil for seems like forever and been picking and prodding with it as a teacher, a department chair, an assistant principal, and a principal. And I agree with Ms. Mack and the people with whom she has been speaking that there's not a, been a lot of conversation about it because it was always very specific in terms of the student population that it was serving. So if you weren't in that population, you probably didn't discuss it. And then it seemed like it sort of trailed out or this sort of was waning, even in terms of saying the word. So our responsibility with it, because it is such a really good program, and now being used for more than those with, the, with IEPs, et cetera, means it is incumbent on us as a system to do what you've just said, uh, Dr. McComas, that we do have to do better in terms of saying to people, this is out here. It really isn't that difficult. We have it, let's use it and let us embrace more of our children who are in need. So I agree with everything that um, Ms. Mack has said, um, and it is on us now not because because we're not talking about money at this point we are talking about how do we embrace this so that people will know it and use it yeah um, and i think you spoke to that i just wanted to to point that out that it is not right now about money about which we are speaking that's a name change but right. we are and you had just said that we are going to do better that was mr offerman's point we must do better Yes, Ms. Pastor, yes. could I make a request then? Could the com curriculum committee members and the, all the board, if they want to, receive actual usage data? That's, I, yeah. I was about to say, I, I have that now and I can send that to all of you yeah. immediately. So that would be very, right. very helpful. Thank you. Absolutely. Right. right. And let me just say that we are happy to take that as our follow on option. As always, we, uh, we believe our job is to support you in your role, right? So that you have full understanding uh, to make good decisions on behalf of our children so that we are happy to do that. I do have on my my follow up action here to uh, pull together that summary for you and I'll work to, to get that to you um, to you all. I'll, uh, I'll try to submit that through the board weekly update. Um, and, and I just so want to be clear that I would never advocate for taking anything away from students who really need it. Um, but I am very concerned when so many teachers said, I think it's something up on top of a, the bar on my laptop. Um, so I, I'd be interested in seeing the data, but I do want to be on record saying that I, you know, if it is a tool that is helping students, then maybe we scale it down even further to the number of students who are actually using it. Well, and, and if I could make an important point there, Ms. Mack, and, and I hear exactly what you're saying, and thank you for that. One of the reasons why we have the district membership at at per year is, I believe, $69,900 um, is because an individual license seat is about $500. For the same amount, we could only give it to about 140 kids. And so when we look at that, we, we look at the number of students in the district with IEPs, which is right around 16,000. Let's, let's assume that a quarter of them maybe have writing right. accommodations that they need. And Kurzweil would be a great tool for that. We could never afford individual licenses for those students. Well, let me rephrase that. We could, but you wouldn't want to. 
<laughs> so <laughs> on this project for the million four, was that prior to the universal? Um, my, under, my understanding is that my understanding, and again, I wasn't in, in this position at the same time, so I, I'm just looking back as best I can, just like you. My understanding is that when they asked for the extra spending authority to take it out to 2027, it was for the the district license rate to reduce those costs as much as we could. Okay, thank you very much for that information. And thank you're, you, Dr. McComas, for agreeing to provide additional information. Sure, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so on that, I think we, if we could have approval for the name change, and I, we will definitely follow up to provide um, responses to give you usage data. And we will also include our um, refreshed professional development or professional learning plan and our communication plan to make sure that um, perhaps new faculty members are, have access to learning about Kurzweil if they did not know. We all appreciate all of those layers and getting that information so that the board can be aware and see those pieces. Thank you. So for name change only, I need a motion please to approve the contract for the name change. So moved, so moved Mac. Thomas. Thank you, Ms. Mack. A uh, second, please. Second, Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Uh, Ms. Cox, can we have a roll call? Ms. Pastor? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Rothman? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. All righty. Um, I thank you then. So we move this forward for the name change. And again, thank you all. Uh, Mr. Thomas, I'm going to give you time right now because I realized we jumped right into the motion. <laughs> so tell us what's on your mind. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, so for Kurzweil, I, I just wanted to mention the conversion of PDFs into uh, to speech. And I think that's something that's really unique to Kurzweil that I, I haven't been able to access before in my education. I know a lot of, we had a lot of struggle with in the past. So for example, could a teacher possibly scan a textbook page and convert it to a PDF and then that textbook page could be read to the students aloud? Yes. And I, I think yep. that's incredible. And, and I, I, I mean, I obviously am not a technology professional, so I don't know if there are other platforms like that available, but it's something that is really amazing. And although there are some other online platforms like Google Dictate or Microsoft Word Dictate, and you know, there are other conversion things from text to, text to speech, you know, to have something like this that is so universal and has everything a part of one program is very amazing. And I, I, I'm excited that it is being used, and I'm excited for all of the things that Dr. McComas and Dr. Elmendorf have said about increasing the usage across the county, because I think that it would be a really great tool for all of our students to use, even if they don't have IEPs. Because uh, I know during virtual learning, I, I wanted to listen to some books. Uh, I, I wanted to be able to hear the textbook instead of reading it on the screen. And so uh, I was able to do that with online platforms, but there's so many extra steps to that. So uh, this, is, this is really nice, and I, I'm excited uh, for the efforts you guys have. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. Mr. Thomas. We see universal access resources are continue to evolve, and so I uh, just thank you for that. Thank you. And that Sorry. universal access is so important because I remember when I was installing it on devices, remember thinking like the stigma that is attached to the student who is going to then be using that computer. And so if all of our students are using it, you know, certainly that stigma is reduced okay. for sure. That that you just said it. That's the word, the, the, the words, the stigma is reduced. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Thomas, for your discussion that well, your conversation um, that went right to um, the application of it. Yeah, thank you so much. All righty. Um, my second favorite thing, I, I really love this agenda. I really have to tell you, and I know Ms. <laughs> Mack like this agenda too, but I love this agenda. I'm so excited. All right. And I know that Ms. Um, I believe, uh, hmm. We Ms. have one more. So on here. No, I was thinking about Ms. Joes because she had indicated okay. that she wanted to be here, particularly for our next subject, which is community schools. Well, Ms. Pasture, before we do that, I think we have one more item that also is coming through contracts. That's a renewal item. It's Brain okay. Pop. Um, and Brain Pop, likewise, has been a resource that we have had in, in BCPS. So I'll just quickly hand it right back over to Dr. Elmendorf and team. Okay. That's Thank fine. you. I'm sorry to slow down. I'm excited about community schools. Today. I know, I know. I'll bring it down, but I know brain pop, brain pop. All right, let's go. 
I thought this is why you were excited, Miss Pastor. I am. I am. I'm, I'm excited. <laughs> I'm excited. I'm so excited. I popped right over it. Okay, go ahead. Okay, I don't have quite as much to say about Brain Pop as I did Kurzweil before handing it over to Dave because I know everyone here is likely familiar with Brain Pop, unlike Kurzweil, perhaps. Um, and if you haven't used Brain Pop, you've at least probably heard of it. And our usage data definitely indicates that this is one of our most popular tools among our teachers. So we're kind of flipping to the other side here, perhaps. And BrainPop has been around since 1999 and has evolved greatly over the years. Uh, we know our st students learn in many different ways and that video technology is one in which students are often most engaged. Uh, I know my son is pursuing a bachelor's in digital animation in the fall, and I know BrainPop is one of the companies he's already reaching out to to perhaps do an internship with and, and maybe even work with when he graduates. Uh, there are so many tools in the edtech space and this like Kurzweil is definitely one of the most reputable and trusted so I'm, I'm glad to bring this one to you as well and with that I will hand it over to Mr. Stovenauer. Uh, thank you. Um, next slide. Thank you. So uh, as a reminder uh, obviously I've talked to this group about Brain Pop before um, when when uh, Dr. McComas was nice enough to let me have some some of your time so I know you're all familiar um, and you're familiar with um, kind of the information literacy that we're going after um, and why we use a lot of these tools. So I'm going to I'm going to skip over a little bit of this in, in the interest of time. Um, next slide, please. So BrainPop is a suite of digital resources of which BCPS has purchased access to five products. We currently have BrainPop, BrainPop Junior, BrainPop Espanol, BrainPop Francais and BrainPop ESL. Um, with our new contract, BrainPop has added some, some more uh, tools. So there is a new platform uh, that they are bringing online for coding, which we hope to integrate into our computer science um, curriculum. Um, and uh, they're also adding BrainPop Science, which we're looking into as well. Um, but certainly these five have proven to be very uh, influential in a lot of what we do in our classrooms. So each product is filled with videos, quizzes, other materials based around a variety of topics, including science, social studies, English, math, arts, music, health, SEL, and engineering and tech. Next slide, please. So currently students and teachers have access to the BrainPop products through the digital content portal and the All Apps portal. Uh, while BrainPop itself is a repository for topics and resources geared toward a variety of grade levels, topics and groups, the other products are more tabled, tailored to meet the needs of particular students. For example, BrainPop Junior is tailored to our younger students with both content and structure of the resources and its materials. BrainPop Espanol and BrainPop Francais are versions of BrainPop presented in these different languages. And BrainPop ELL is a resource that utilizes the format and function of BrainPop while focusing on the needs of our ELL population. This resource also includes resources for assessing students' language ability, as well as providing content specific to those students' individual needs. Next slide. So I want to take an opportunity to remind everyone of some of the terminology and differences between what we talk about as digital resources and digital tools. Uh, Kurzweil, for example, would be a digital tool um, where we're inputting content into it and then manipulating it in some way. Uh, BrainPop is a digital resource, so where the content is part of the experience of the student and teacher in the digital environment. BrainPop provides content in a unique way that helps to supplement the BCPS curriculum and presents to students and teachers a variety of resources for learning. Uh, next slide, please. So in my previous visit to you about BrainPop, I believe we, we talked about doing a little demonstration, and I know that there's probably not time for that today, but uh, that once students and teachers are in the portal, it provides uh, just a variety of content. Um, you, you can see those content areas on that in the picture on your left across the top of the page there. Um, each day they put up new topics um, for a daily kind of interactive activity. Um, on this particular day when I grabbed this screenshot, it was all about rainforests. I think when I went on today, it was about um, genetics. Um, and so they just they provide a lot of things. And once you're into a particular area like political party origins on your right, 
there are a variety of things available for teachers and students um, that they can interact with that. So there's always a movie provided and you've seen probably seen a lot of those with the robot and uh, and just providing in a very clear uh, entertaining way a variety of information. Um, there's usually a quiz associated that a challenge uh, for the students as to their recall or their understanding of what's going on in that in that video. Um, there's a graphic organizer. There's primary resources that are available. So, for example, in this political art party origins example that I provided here, the primary resources go back to uh, some some of the founding fathers documents where they talk about the dangers of political parties. It provides some of the platforms for Democrat and Republican parties. So, again, just a real uh, a plethora of 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 sources available to students. There's readings, there's worksheets. Um, they are, we are also, um, they're bringing, this is where some of that coding will come in. Creative coding is where students can take the, some of those materials and make their own uh, uh, activities to go along with some of these things. So the make a movie and the creative coding are in those areas. So those are just coming online line now. I'd love to to be able to tell you more, but I'm afraid uh, my own ignorance of, of what they're bringing on <laughs> uh, impacts what I can tell you about those right now. Uh, next slide, please. So BCPS teachers have utilized BrainPop in a numerous different ways and housed those ideas and materials in Schoology, in their courses, in public materials, and in the curriculum. Uh, in addition, the BrainPop Pop platform provides a large amount of resources for teachers to assist with their planning and lesson development. BrainPop materials as presented to teachers are organized around standards that align to Common Core, NGSS, and US state standards. For teachers, BrainPop also offers a large variety of free resources that are timely and relevant related to social emotional learning and to student achievement. Uh, next slide. Um, this is a snapshot of our usage data. So this is um, since February of 2020. Um, you'll see that those two blank spaces around uh, December of 20 and January 21, that was where we uh, were not able to pull that data after the ransomware attack. But this is, as Dr. Elmendorf said, this is one of our most highly, highly utilized digital resources. Um, total logins were, uh, were 3.7 million. Um, and that's across students and staff. One of the things that we want to do, and and Ms. Mack, this goes to your question about usage data. So I, I apologize for for saying this directly to you, but um, one of the things we want to do moving forward with BrainPop is do a better integration for single sign-on. Right now, we have a generic password for everyone, and so we want to bring that single sign-on usage, and that will give us even better data about how particular students, teachers, uh, organizational units are accessing BrainPop and what materials they're actually accessing instead of just this generic data you see here about logins. But but I still think this is valuable in, in it to show the, the, the level of use that we have uh, in the system. Uh, and next slide, and obviously uh, that, you, again, you have some familiarity with this, so I don't want to, to, to belabor the point, but obviously, if you have any questions right now, I'd, I'd love to help. Uh, let me start with Mr. Thomas because I pulled him in last to see if he has a question or a comment. Mr. Thomas. Thank you. I just want to start off by saying that I think I, I think brain pop is one of the most informational sources I've used uh, in, in my education. I when I when I saw this the other day when I was looking over the agenda, I like was brought back to my fifth grade year in uh, elementary school, like when I was sitting in the library and we were learning about Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Um, and, and we were watching a brain pop video. And then the next thing I know, I'm in the freshman year in my biology class and we're learning about meiosis through brain pop. And, and brain pop is, is just, it just has such a plethora of resources that teachers are constantly accessing in different ways. And so I, I, I'm very excited to see this and I hope we do renew this contract because uh, I think it, it's an amazing resource that it, it's just incredible. Um, But my one concern, which uh, was addressed uh, a second ago, was about the single sign-on versus like the generic passcode versus, you know, students being able to use their own information to log into the brain pop platforms i know that you know I, there were sometimes when i was trying to access it at home for different projects and i wasn't really able to access it because i didn't remember the username and password that was applied to everyone 
So uh, the fact that we're looking into a single uh, sign on with uh, usernames and passwords for students is, is very nice and I'm excited to see that. So well, thank you. And, and in response to that, I'd say that is one of the quote unquote benefits of the ransomware attack is that it's given us this opportunity to move forward with the vendor to find a new solution to do exactly that. So. Awesome. Thank you so much. And uh, I'm really excited uh, to see BrainPop again. I've, I haven't seen it in a few years, but that's probably because of my uh, different classes in high school. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. And I love the word plethora. All right, I'm going to go to Mr. Offerman and then I'm going to come to Ms. Mack last. Mr. Offerman, any questions or comments? None, thank you. All right, thank you, Mr. Offerman. Ms. Mack? Um, I just wanted to say when I was speaking to teachers over the weekend and on Monday, um, whereas they weren't, you know, too fond of Kurzweil, no, not one teacher with whom I spoke had anything negative to say about brain pop. And I was lying in bed last night thinking that maybe it's been a year since we talked about this. And I remember telling this story and I'll tell it for Mr. Christian's, uh, um, for Mr. Thomas's benefit. I walked up on my neighbor's porch one night to drop something off and two BCPS students were hunched over their laptops. And I said, hey girls, what are you doing? And they looked at me rather disgustedly and said, well, we were trying to get on TikTok, but my mom made us get on brain pop. And I still just every time I see them, I, I think about that night that, you know, they were settling for brain pop when they really wanted to get on TikTok. Um, but I have never heard anything bad about brain pop. So I fully support this contract. Thank you, Miss Mack. Um, and thank you for the presentation. You're you're very you're very welcome. I'd also like I, I meant to say this before I invited um, Amanda Lanza here today. She's our new coordinator for library media programs and she would normally have done this, but she's brand new and I figured I'd take the bullet on this one. <laughs> and um, so she she is in attendance today, so I just wanted to give her a little shout out. And welcome. welcome to Welcome. And you see, there were no bullets to take. <laughs> not, not at all. You know, I, I appreciate our committee discussion. I believe that in our committee, we get the opportunity to ask some real questions and we do our very best to help you um, in, in answering those questions with real answers. So we appreciate the robust conversation, truly. I, th I think it's good work that we do in this committee. So thank you. Absolutely. All right. Speaking so, of bullets, Mr. Thomas, make sure you don't tell Chloe I told that stroller story. OK. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so it, could we just do a quick vote, Ms. Uh, Pasture? Yeah, for absolutely. Record? Yeah, I, I, I need a motion. May I have a motion, please, to accept it? Um, Thank you, Ms. Mack. Do I have a second? Second, Second Offerman. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Ms. Cox, if you'll do a roll call, please. Ms. Pasture? Yes. Ms. Mack? Yes. Mr. Offerman? Yes. Mr. Thomas? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. All right, then let's keep moving. Yes, so. ma'am. With no further ado, we are getting into the, our program updates as we're always excited to bring and share um, for our committee members and for anyone else who may view our committee meeting at a later time. Um, our, we're very pleased to present next um, an update or really information on where we are with our community schools initiative. We're very excited about this. I am going to at this point hand over facilitation to Dr. Wistead and Ms. Stan Sperry um, as uh, Dr. Elmendorf and I will probably excuse ourselves in the next five minutes. Uh, and I just want to say thank you as always to the committee. Um, and with no further ado, I'll turn it over. Well, thank you, Dr. McComas and Dr. Elmendorf for being here today and for your contributions and thank you. be safe. Thank you. Thanks. Dr. Wistead. Okay, thank you. Um, as many of you know, Ms. Uh, Michelle Stansbury is here with me and we're just going to be um, touching on uh, the blueprint just, just a little bit. I know Ms. Pester, you're very passionate about it and our hope is to be coming back to um, a group to give like a more broad overview of the blueprint in general, but I just wanted to set the stage that a part of the blueprint is our concentration of poverty grant and the community schools is something that is birthed out of that. So Michelle's gonna be talking about where we've been with community schools and where we're going with community schools and we're here to um, answer questions about that. So with that, Ms. Stansberry. 
Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Stansberry, thank you for being here. Absolutely. Um, the information I'll be sharing with you tonight is based on what we currently know through the legislation for Blueprint for Maryland's Future. So if you could advance to the next slide for me, we're going to take just a few minutes to talk about the concentration of poverty grant and how it is positioned in the Blueprint. We'll also talk about how schools become eligible for the grant and identification as a community school. We'll look at the BCPS community school model, which we have been working very diligently on um, pulling together and some system wide implications that um, may cause us to return to talk to you in the future about some upcoming initiatives around community schools. So the concentration of poverty grant is part of Maryland House, Maryland State House Bill 1300 and 1372. And in this bill, the grant is distributed in two parts. The first part is through personnel funding. The second part is through per pupil allocation. Now the schools that are eligible are based on their poverty percentages as of October 31st from the prior year. And that's also based on October 31st enrollment. So both enrollment and low income counts from um, the prior school year, the prior school years rather. There have been some changes in the legislation around how schools become eligible for the grant from 1300 to 1372. So I wouldn't be surprised if additional changes were to come down the pike later on in the year. Um, but I just wanted to really give you a context for where we are in the moment. Eligibility based on the changes in 1372 is really an average of three years now. So it's, it's a little more challenging to predict which schools will be eligible for the concentration of poverty grant and, and as a result a community school. But what we do know is that the eligibility threshold will allow for more and more schools every year. And in a moment you'll take a minute, you'll um, take a look at how we have grown over the past three years. So the first two years of grant eligibility, the school receives the personal grant front fund and that fund actually gives them funding for a community school coordinator and in our district we recently um, hired a bunch of community school facilitators, a 12 month um, seven and a half hour a day position and they are an arm of the school administration to really help the administrative team with pulling together the infrastructure to implement a community school program. In year three, schools get both the personnel grant funding and a per pupil allocation funding. And that per pupil allocation increases annually from the third year through year 10 gradually um, and until the year 2030. So an important part of how the funding should be used is really tied to the school's needs assessment and their multi-year community school plan. So our schools in year one are taking a full year to develop a very comprehensive needs assessment that takes a deeper look at the data behind the data we are already looking at in our district. For example, they will be looking at um, unemployment rates, they will be looking at eviction rates, they will be looking at um, uh, rates of all other types of community influential data that really impacts how students show up and are prepared to learn when they um, come to school. So this is a, a really deep data dive that is pulled together by the facilitator, but then there is a community school team of teachers, students, parents, community partners who all have an equal voice in what that data means, really digging through that, and then spending year two to develop a multi-year community school plan. In the next slide, you'll see NEA's definition of a community school and as you read through this definition what you'll notice is that community schools is more than just it goes beyond the school it goes beyond the classroom it's really about the supports that are necessary for a community to be able to support students to learn and be actively engaged in their learning at school. 
In the next slide, you will, will take just a few minutes to watch a two minute video that gives a more descriptive understanding of what community schools would be. What makes a school a great school? Caring for the whole child. Expanding the horizons of learning. Building relationships with family. Working together to realize a shared vision. This is the school every student needs. This is a community school. Community schools are public schools that partner with stakeholders to create the conditions students need to thrive. Community schools can be found across the United States and their numbers are growing fast. But what exactly makes a school a community school? They integrate student supports. Clinics, counselors, and other services ensure each and every student is ready to learn. They expand and enrich learning. Extended school days, summer programs, and real-world experiences help students reach their full potential. They engage families and communities. Partnering with residents to identify and meet community needs makes everyone feel safe, welcome, and involved in school. They lead in collaboration. Inclusive decision-making and peer learning builds trust among students, educators, families, and communities. When a school stands on these four pillars, it's a community school. Research supports this four pillar approach, but there's no one size fits all model. Every community school is different because each community is different. Figuring out what it looks like in your community starts by getting actual community members involved. That's the full-time job of community school coordinators. They're the human bridge connecting all the partners and stakeholders that make community schools possible. So that's what makes a school a community school. Now, how do you pay for it? Startup costs like hiring a full-time coordinator can be raised from foundations or state and local governments. Tapping into existing funding and partnering with local businesses can bring in service providers. Sharing resources and staff with partners can help everyone do more. And as a community school becomes more established, leaders can advocate for budgets that sustain their impact and new funding to expand it. Every community school is different. What will yours be like? Get started at communityschools.futureforlearning.org. So as the video shared, this is about creating conditions that support students with being successful when they get to the school building. This is more than just social work supports or counseling supports. This is the support that the community, the families, the students, the teachers need in order to be successful. What you see on this next slide is growth. The growth of the community schools in Baltimore County has been significant over the last three years. Cohort A was from school year 2019-2020, and you'll see we only had four schools. We more than doubled that in year two to 10. We are now in year three, and we have 22. We are projected to yet double again for next, the 22-23 school year. So the growth of the community school model in BCPS will be significant. In the moment, all of the schools you see listed here are Title I schools, except for Rosedale Center. So it, it's important to note that this is not just about Title I schools. As we continue to grow over time, community schools will be Title I and non-Title I schools. And so this it will be a significant shift for us in really looking deeply into um, pieces of data that we really haven't asked schools to dig deeply into. Should I stop to take questions or should we keep going? Yeah, let's just stop for a moment okay. because this is this is very serious business. So I'm gonna start in the middle now, um, Mr. Offerman. Yes, is there any particular significance why only one middle school has been uh, selected in the uh, in the uh, in the first three years? And do we have plan to have more 
more uh, more middle schools next year. Oh yes, this number will grow significantly. So remember, the legislation was really taking a look at identifying schools. These schools are identified by the state of Maryland, and they were identifying schools based on annual poverty data. It has now shifted to looking at a three year average. The next shift will be determining schools on a three year average but omitting any data from the 2021 school year due to the in impact of the pandemic. And so although Woodlawn Middle School is the only school in the moment with a three year average of 70% or higher poverty, and I, I apologize, I neglected to say that in the first year, the threshold was 80% or higher, year two, 75% or higher, year three, 70% or higher, and next year, 65 60 and until we get to 50% and again that might change in the legislation. So what we are projecting next year is to have five additional middle schools and a significant number of elementary schools as well as centers, but that's based on what we know now. Um, I, I, I've heard from so many um, stakeholders that there's lots of legislation and advocacy around changing how we determine school eligibility. So I could tell you today one thing and then say something totally different to you in the future as the legislation changes. Excuse me, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you and thank you Mr. Offerman. Uh, Ms. Mack? Yes, thank you. Um, can you tell me why Riverview is has an ash? Maybe it's at the bottom of the page. I just can't see it on my screen. Yeah, thank you for asking that question. So the reason Riverview has an asterisk is because they're actually not eligible this year. They are a grandfathered school. And so um, Riverview, for a variety of reasons, um, has not been collecting um, low income data using farms applications. They've been a CEP school right. since the CEP pilot. So when we talk about um, shifts in poverty at Riverview, and I think we may have had some conversations about this in the past, we're looking at a three year average for Riverview and they've actually dropped below 70% looking at a three year average. Um, we anticipate as the threshold drops, Riverview will come back into um, eligibility, but any school, not just Riverview, that falls out of eligibility and potentially back in has a two year grandfathering period where they get just okay. the personnel grant. They don't get the PPA funding, even though they're technically in year three, they are not eligible for PPA funding. They are only getting the personnel grant and that's really smart, a really smart piece of the legislation because schools do go in and out, right? When we think about shifts in poverty and um, boundary changes and all of those things. So Riverview, we've, we've been really trying to help support them. And, and they need anticipate. help, that's why they I ask. Do. Yep, they do. We actually have some additional grants that are going specifically towards Riverview to kind of support some of the initiatives that are happening there. Then my other quick question is when you first started speaking, you talked about the legislation looking at unemployment rates, eviction rates. Is that factored into what we see on this screen or is that another effort? So that actually is the school based effort. What okay. we're asking schools to do when they do their needs assessment is look beyond academic data, look beyond the data you have in BCPS and really identify what are their inconsistencies that are occurring in your school community itself. Do you have high eviction rates? Do you have high unemployment rates? What are your recid recid I'm going to mess that word up, so I'm not even going to say it, but you, you get where I'm going. <laughs> You got me, but my, my point is we're asking them to look at the data behind the data we're already looking at because that's the one piece of data that we haven't been taking a really close look at at the school level at least to really talk about, well, wait a minute, if we have high eviction rates, what eviction prevention programs can we put in place so we can decrease mobility at the school level? Or what consistency can we have across schools to support families who may be moving around within a community but have access to the same levels of support? So it, it is a deep dive at the school level looking at a multitude of data sources and it really does take a full year to do that really well. Would we all, my last question is this, will we also look at teacher turnover at a school level or yes. have the school do that? 
Yes, schools, yep, schools have the option of looking at teacher turnover. They have the option of actually looking at um, the percentage of vacancies they have, how many long term subs okay. they have. I mean, all of those things are big pieces of the puzzle. And we actually will be coming back to talk to you in the near future about an MOU that we have created with TAPCO because we see them as partners in this work. And they really started this initiative without any funding from the state. And so um, in that partnership, there's there's strong advocacy to make sure that the voice of educators, teachers, students, parents, community members are all part of this discussion because th there's a multitude of factors that impact student success. Thank you very much for all of this information. You're welcome. Yeah, this is great and thank you. But our, before I go to Mr. Um, Thomas and then Ms. Joes, I just want to point out that very last thing that you said, I don't know if you remember what that last piece was, but, but that collaboration. Can you repeat what you just said the last thing? Because that's critical to It hear. is critical. It's a big piece of the puzzle and it's something that we're really trying to support schools with. So schools have to create shared decision making teams and those teams have to be um, inclusive of students, of families, of teachers, or not just teachers, staff members, period, um, in addition to community members. And the one thing we're really helping schools to, to think through is what's a good balance? So how many family members is enough family members? How many staff members are enough staff members? So that there is this very inclusive voice and then looking particularly at who those voices represent that are in relation to the school's demographics so that you have a really clear perspective um, that takes into account the voices of the L population, of your special ed population, of, of all of your populations. I know I know there's a, um, another slide coming up about this, but you, you got me started, so I, I, I wanted to make sure I kind of explained in detail that we are pushing this in a very intentional way to make sure voices are heard. And and I, I know, and we, I, we will let you get back to your slides, but that is important. Um, you remember when we had for real school improvement teams and for real school yeah. improvement plans, and it had all of those folks, because sometimes folks think that closing the gap yeah. is all about just what teachers and administrators absolutely certain instructional folks um in, from central office do and they forget that it's all of those pieces and that's what sets that community school ap apart but the idea when we were on the funding committee for blueprint our whole goal was that ultimately all schools would follow that model that all schools would be entrenched in the notion of total community um, yeah. because there's such blending in terms of the students in those schools. So where Ms. Mack, you see, or Mr. Offerman asked about the one middle school, mm -hmm. the intention is, as you pointed out, that it's gonna grow. And yeah. the idea is that at some point it will sort of implode, I guess, because all of the schools are going to have this model they will look and that is one of the goals down the road is that all of the schools are going to look at all of those pieces for the children because we're going to have such a large array of our students as yeah. our counties grow so that is so critical so critical to ask yeah. let me get mr and thomas well just oh, to also point out michelle brings uh she's got a great saying when she's explaining this to people and principals and stakeholders, it's like we need to look at the data that can move the data that we've been examining, right? As a school progress plan or school improvement team, you always are looking at the same school-based data and here's an opportunity to look at other data to move that data. Yes, so, absolutely. Yes. I love that, the data to move the data. Yes, that's <laughs> outstanding. That's outstanding, that's great. Uh, Mr. Thomas, uh, thank you. Uh, could we go back to the previous slide before I ask my question? I just wanted to reference that. The schools, going back to yes, the schools. schools. Yeah, yeah. Jim, can we okay. go back to? While, while reading that, um, I guess my question would be, when I, when I was looking at these schools, I was like, oh my gosh, I've visited all these schools recently. And that's really because 
all these schools are kind of in the east zone is what I'm realizing. Yes. The majority of these schools are in the east zone. And so my question is, um, uh, are we are we planning to bring this model into the west zone and the central zone more into some of our title one schools there? Is there a reason that we're only focusing or we're focusing majorly on the east zone at the beginning? Yeah, so that's a great question. So remember this, these are schools that are identified by the state of Maryland based on poverty percentages, right? So this will grow to what in the moment will be 50%, any school that has 50% or higher poverty. But if we do this well, and we're, we call this an initiative on purpose, if we do this well, this will become the way of schooling in Baltimore County. So it won't just be if you're a state identified community school, then you have this amazing model. We really think if we make this a movement in our district that this will become a model that catches fire and no matter what your school is, this will become our regular way of um, supporting students and families in every school. So it, it will grow. You will see this list be much, much larger in the next year or two. Awesome. And, and, and again, Ms. Stansberg, you have just nailed it. This is why I get so excited about this and why they are not more West Side. See, we keep conflating the notion. You look at scores, test scores, and you make the, the people make a decision that that is commensurate with a poverty level. And that's not necessarily no. so. We just have to do better with what we're doing. So it's not necessarily so. You with me, Mr. Thomas? So this is why from the state, you're not seeing some of those schools. It's not that they're being ignored, but we forget what the some of the economic levels for our, our, our communities on the west side. They're higher. The poverty level looks different. It's just about what we're not doing or need to do. So as Ms. Stansberry just said, um, we're looking, I said imploding, but she said it's so much nicer, but we're <laughs> looking at this ultimately being the way we handle all of our schools in our system. Um, Ms. Joes, do you have any a question that will apply to where we've gotten to this far or shall we continue on? Thank you, Ms. Um, Pastor. I will actually like to watch the rest of the presentation and my question was asked by Mr. Thomas, so thank you. Excellent. All righty, then we'll continue on. I'm probably taking up far more time, so I'm going to go through a little quicker. Um, if you could advance to the next slide, which I believe is really Baltimore County's um, community school infographic. This was created with a variety of stakeholders, students, administrators, teachers, bargaining units, families, community partners. We spent several months digging through what does what do we want community schools to be in Baltimore County? And this is the infographic that will be the um, forward facing vit, um, picture of community schools in our district. And the next slide, um, what we'll show you is what does what does this mean? So we've created five commitments that we are making to community schools. The very first commitment is equity and inclusion, then family and community engagement, college and career readiness, safe and supportive learning environment, and health and social supports. We do not see these commitments in isolation of each other. We see an interconnectivity between all of these commitments. And so when schools are digging into their data, we're asking them, in your family and community engagement data, where do you see an intersection of equity and inclusion? Are the families that are accessing resources, the families that actually need those resources, or is there a different resource we are not providing for them? So it's about really taking a very comprehensive look at how each commitment is related to each other, but then also how well are we doing in implementing those commitments in our district? So I wanted to just really quickly in the next slide tell you a little bit about more about that needs assessment. Some of if you're residing in a Baltimore County community, you may hear from some of our community school facilitators because what we're asking them is to take a really um, detailed sample size, specific sample size, um, assessment of the needs of the community based on each stakeholder group. So they will be conducting a community school resource inventory where they're looking at in resources that are already available to the community and looking at that by each commitment. 
the existing data review will look at all of the data points that I mentioned a little bit earlier, plus additional data points that come from US Census data, as well as data from Baltimore County government. Key informant interviews. These are interviews of, with folks that have been in the community for some time, been in the school for some time, and what can they tell us about what the needs are in that community? And here's where you may hear from some of our community school facilitators. They may invite you to participate in listening sessions or to complete a stakeholder survey and it's not your typical stakeholder survey. It really goes deeply into um, do you do you find that you or your neighbors have food insecurity issues? It really goes deep, very deeply into um, looking at the data for each of those commitments and those listening sessions are open times to have a dialogue with um, those in from each individual stakeholder group, not collectively as one group, but individually. So a school of 500, might be required to um, con have contact or some type receive some type of feedback from up to 200 family members. That's going to take us time. It's going to take building trust and, and discussion. And so that's why the process is so in depth. In the next slide, what you'll see are some supports that will come out of the community school needs assessment, um, rebranding the community, legal services for families, career building, extracurricular programs, stable housing, health services, really authentic community partnerships. And for us at the system level, we will begin to feel some local policy and procedural changes that might impact us here in BCPS, but also in Baltimore County government and even in state government. And so this is again a movement. It is so much more than just um, changing what's happening in one school community because school communities are so connected for us in Baltimore County. It's about really making our county a better place. In the next slide, I just want to talk really um, briefly about the initiative effectiveness. And so we are committed to making sure that there's a coordination of resources, meaning that multiple funding sources potentially may be braided together to provide the supports that come out of that needs assessment. So schools will be creating one needs assessment, one multi-year plan, and then saying, how can my Title I fund support this? How can my community school funds support this? How can this other donation or grant or in-kind volunteer um, provide support to implement this program? So we'll really be looking at helping schools coordinate and um, resources. We have a partnership with the Y of Central Maryland, and they are really helping to build our capacity and our muscle in the district around community schools. This is a district movement, and so we are building awareness across the district. We need to build an infrastructure within our district. Right now, um, the community schools initiative is within the Title I office, but remember I shared with you earlier, this is not just about Title I schools. And so we have to be prepared as a district. What have we done to really build infrastructure district level to support system wide to support community schools as they begin to be identified by the state? We are community school facilitators. We have to invest in them and make sure that they are championing, championing, I'm sorry, I'm tongue tied today, that they are champions for um, what their schools need and finding the right partnerships and, and ensuring that um, families and students have everything they need to be successful. Robust professional learning will be important, not just for the facilitators, not just for school staff, but for us centrally. This is um, what we're considering one of our professional learning opportunities to build system wide understanding about where we are with community schools and what that means for us as a district. So you will hear more and more and more about community schools from me and from others as we continue to move forward in this initiative. We do have an outside evaluator who will be evaluating the initiative um, regularly. We are coming up with a timeline for what that looks like, but we want to make sure that there's annual reporting that will come back to you all. Um, for updates annually. And um, before we move on, I also just wanted to mention, you know, as Michelle's talking about this coordination of resources and funding, as you know, Dr. McComas always likes us to come to the curriculum committee to talk about contracts. So you will be seeing 
the Stansbury and I um, coming to you because uh, if you remember back to what she was saying that at, at by year three they're getting a per pupil allocation as well as if they are a title one school they have a per pupil allocation and so um, you know there's contracts that will be coming forward. They may have very high spending authorities when we think about the number of community schools that we have right now and how we anticipate you know, doubling every year. Um, so I just wanted to put that on your radar that you may be seeing us coming with contracts and it, you know, it's because we want to offer schools the option to use outside vendors for some of the uh, community supports that they may need to access. And I want to add that some of those contracts you'll see come forward are innovative in, in design. There will be things that you might not have, we may not have brought forth in the past, but we really feel like will make a true difference um, in the school community. So if you could advance to the next slide for me, I think I'm just about done. This goes back to um, what the implications are for us as a district. So as a district, we need to develop a system wide stakeholder steering committee that will be developed over the course of this year. Hopefully we can actually begin um, meeting as a committee before the end of the school year, school based school decision making teams and then multi year planning for central office infrastructure we will need staffing centrally to be able to support this initiative. Um, it is, we do not have um, enough of what we need human capital wise to be able to really help schools do this and do this well. We, we want to see results from this and not just um, schools buying more things. We actually want to see this actually have an impact. Um, we'll, we'll have to work on some procurement supports for our purchasing office because procurement, as Melissa mentioned, as Dr. Wistit mentioned a moment ago, um, schools, there will be an influx of funding in our district that at some point will exceed the $35 million Title I budget. And so um, we have to prepare ourselves for that. And then system-wide community partnerships. There are partnerships that we can actually have um, as a system that support all of our schools versus schools finding their own individual partners. So with that being said, um, I open the floor up. I think oh, the last Wait a minute, slide. wait. Oh. I need you to go back to that slide, please. Okay. Um, yes, all right. I just wanna take a moment because I want the committee and Ms. Joes and anyone else who might have joined, but the board, I want you to look at this list and process board work, separating what is operations from what is the work of the board, because the embedded in here, you should see some of the things that are about board work, that this committee is going to have to in some way lead the board work in terms of what we're doing instructionally, educationally, and Ms. Stansberry said, talked about the money coming in, but we need to process this in terms of that bill. So we're not trying to um, manage money, maybe in some of the ways we were managing it, you know, in, in our past. This is new what we have to have for our schools is going to be attached to our plan and it's not going to be same thing for every school exactly but we're going to have to change our thinking we're going to have to change our thinking about how we work with our constituents and helping them to understand what's going on and why things look a little differently. Understand that all of the money is not coming out what used to be just our base budget, that it's coming from other places where they expect on a state level that we're doing the things that are in our plans so while we're gnashing our teeth and saying, well, this looks exorbitant or whatever, what have you. It is a part of what we put in our plan that was accepted and it must happen. It must be reasonable, but it must happen. So that's why I wanted us to see this because we have to be um, the drum beaters because not everybody is on this board. So each each committee 
is going to be beating the drum for that section for which they are responsible when they bring it back to the full board. We're going to have to start thinking differently. Thank you. All right, if you can continue on. I just needed to say that while that list was there. You no, we get... appreciate that. Yeah, we're here now for questions and, and that, um, you know, thank you for that because you are correct. It, it's going to look very different when we're coming through with contracts because you know, it will have, as I shared before, probably a very high spending authority so that we give our schools options of what uh, partners and vendors they may need to use. It doesn't mean that we're going to reach and hit that spending authority because with every school it's going to be different, but we may have to front load with contracts, um, you know, in order to give them options. So thank you for that. Okay, anyone else? Questions. Um, let me start this. We have, uh, I'll start with our guest. Ms. Jones, do you have any questions? And then I'll go back to Mr. Thomas, then Mr. Offerman, and Ms., then Ms. Mack. Thank Ms. you, Ms. Pasteur. Um, my one, can you hear me? Yes. My mm -hmm. question is, there have been community schools in other jurisdictions in Maryland. Do we have data comparing how those, um, and I'm just talking about student achievement, but other outcomes for, for the whole child. Um, do we have data to see how they have been impacted? Or we, I know Baltimore City has a lot of community schools in other jurisdictions, and you don't have to answer that right now, but if you know it at the top of your head. Thank you. I don't, I thank you for that question. I don't actually have the data in front of me, but here's what I will say. We did, um, as we were thinking about what does this look like in Baltimore County, we've had extensive conversations about um, are we replicating other models that have worked well? And what we've done is we've taken a look at national models. There are some amazing models in Cincinnati and Austin. Baltimore City has some really great pieces. So does PG County. And we took all of the really good pieces from all of those models to really develop a model that we feel like will be really beneficial. So I can give you the data that we looked at to make those decisions, but we did kind of pull from a variety of different places. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, um, Ms. Jones, Ms. Stansberry. Um, Mr. Offerman, I'm probably making that up. I've probably just changed the order I said, but nevertheless, work with me. Mr. Offerman? None at this time, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thomas? Thank you, Ms. Peshaw. Um, Dr. Wistead and Ms. Stansbury, uh, thank you both so much for this presentation. It was so inspiring. I, I loved seeing all of the plans and it's going to be a lot of work, but I I'm so excited to see both of you taking the lead in this. And Ms. Stansbury, uh, I'm excited to see all the things that uh, are going to come from this. Um, I was at Berkshire Elementary School at the ground or no, the ribbon cutting ceremony yesterday. And Berkshire Elementary School is on the list for the year three uh, or year one and year two, the third column. It was in the yes. list of the third column mm -hmm. of and I did not know what a community school was when I when I when I was there uh, initially, but I heard her discussing how amazing it's been so far in the first what two months of school having a community school having the implementation team. She was speaking so highly of it. She was like, Dr. Williams, oh. the community school is so amazing. I love that we have the community facilitator now. I'm loving this. It's good. Thank you so much for all of this. It's going to be so much. It's going to be so great. You know, now with their new building, I'm really excited to see everything that, 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 that I can bring to the Berkshire community and everything I can bring to all the other communities. Um, my home school, Middlesex Elementary School, was right on that list. And to now see that as a community school. My little siblings, they go to Sussex Elementary School right now. To see that on the school, to see the kind of uh, new communities that can be established in these areas is, is, is so inspiring. And I was tearing off a little bit just then when I was, oh. when I was looking at the presentation. Um, and so I just wanted to say that and thank you uh, so much. I do have two questions. Um, one is what have some of those extracurricular programs that uh, were talked about, have, how, what have they looked like so far with the community schools? I know that uh, last year being virtual, uh, maybe they wouldn't be, weren't able to be as implemented as much, but do you have any data about that or any information about that? Yeah, so this is years, schools won't actually begin to implement real programming until they build the infrastructure to do so. And so because it takes a year to do the needs assessment, another year, not just to complete the multi-year plan, 
but to have the infrastructure to complete it. So I can have a plan, but I need the partnerships to be able to implement that plan. And I need to, the, the um, staffing to be able to support the implementation of that plan. So the only schools who are ready to implement programming are our Group A Cohort A schools. Those are those four schools in Riverview. We're finding creative ways to support them with other grants, but um, they are looking at this Girls on the Run um, that actually happens to be at Riverview. There's another Let Them Run that will also occur at Riverview. Um, some of our other schools have some before and after care programs. I mean, we have some really amazing things and, and there is an exciting piece coming from um, three of our cohort A schools that you're going to hear about um, fairly soon that I know contract. I'm excited. Yes, right, right. coming as a contract. I am super excited to bring it forward. I think you're going to be excited to bring to, when you hear about it. I hope you will. I hope you'll feel <laughs> the jitteriness I feel about it, but I, I don't want to let the cat out the bag. But there are some really amazing, innovative innovation is the key word in this things that will come out of this process. Thank you. And my second question is just, um, I know there's going to be, we're going to be reviewing a lot of contexts going forward, but if there is one thing you could say to us board members so that we can continue to make this, see this as a, as a possibility and see this work, uh, what would it be? And how can we best support uh, all the efforts in this project? Ooh, I love that. Join the movement. Okay. That's it. Join the movement. Awesome. It's a movement. Yes. I was say the same thing, just support. Support, support the, the movement. Yes, yeah, support the movement. <laughs> And make right, sure thanks. you signed up for that May November session so you understand <laughs> the role of the board in all of this. Ms. Matt, thank you. Um, yes, um, Ms. Stansberry and um, Dr. Wisted, last night we had the budget meeting and we talked about the, the amount of ESSER funds that we had received and that those funds run through 2024. Will you access any of those funds in the short term to accomplish anything that you've outlined in any of your slides? So um, the funds <laughs> that Ms. Stansbury is talking about are blueprint through the blueprint, different from ESSER. Um, so there's a concentration of poverty grant. So there, as she said, it's excess of the $34 million that we already have in Title I. So we would not um, the access, I mean, the schools obviously access the things that all the other schools get through the ESSER grant funds, um, you know, because they can't be denied those things, but we don't need any additional funding from that specific to community schools because we have another grant that supports it. Okay, and then my last question is rather granular. When we talk about a community partnership, do we ever or will we ever look at things like um, accessing um, senior living facilities that are close to our schools um, to create a partnership um, and maybe use money to provide a bus to pick the people yes. up to have them come to the school? Um, I mean, yes. I just think I've read a study and it wasn't in America. It was in another country where every day in these schools, um, people from senior living communities come in not they were they're just like one on one with kids to help the kids with anything that they need help with and i think it's an untapped potential yes um that is certainly um, stands very saying she has to step away for a minute um yes that is absolutely something that um schools could use their funds for if that is part of their needs assessment and their multi year plan so Ms. Mack, I don't know which schools uh, on the list were in your area, maybe Baltimore Highlands. I'm not sure. Baltimore is that Highlands, short? Riverview, and Woodlawn Middle School. All right. Yes. Get involved. Join their uh, stakeholder groups um, when they're doing their needs assessments and their multi-year planning. Um, but yes, that is absolutely something um, that they can use their funds for. Great, thank you very much. And thank you very much for this presentation. It was informative and um, it's it's very encouraging. Thank you. Thank you, um, uh, Dr. Wisted. Please um, share our gratitude with um, Ms. Stansberry as yeah. well. Yes, it I was, will. It was just a, a, a beautiful presentation. Um, yeah. Uh, all righty, now 
Miss Mac, this is for you. This is your part <laughs> of this committee meeting. We're going to talk about MCAT. Yes, yes, we have Mr. Connolly um, with us as uh, requested to give us some updates about MCAT. So thank you, Mr. Connolly. Thank you all. And uh, before I get started, I'd like to give a shout out to one of my favorite colleagues, Michelle Stansberry. Uh, Michelle, oftentimes we say bring the Cadillac and not the Chevy and you rolled in with a Maserati. So fabulous job, Michelle. As always, I love um, working with you as well as seeing the work that you do to support our students, our schools and our communities. So thank you so much. Today we're going to talk about MCAP updates um, in the last uh, four years in MSDE, we've had some significant seismic shifts in how we assess students, <clears throat> the tools we use, and the lack of opportunity to do so. Um, again, MCAP will continue to evolve. This year's spring testing will be the last year of the present format, and it will be evolving to a different format for spring of 2023. So next slide, please. So what is MCAP? For those of you that may not be as familiar, it is a highly comprehensive suite of assessments that are required across English language arts, math, science, social studies, alt assessments, which is the dynamic learning maps for our students who um, are not diploma bound, um, English learners and early childhood. Throughout these assessments, students are um, looking at growth and achievement in standards-based, criterion-based assessments in specific content areas and compared to their progress over time. So in English language arts, we have assessments for students in grades three through eight and grade 10. In math, also grades three through eight, and also including algebra one, and for students in middle school, geometry and algebra two if they're taking those courses. For science, we have MISA in grades five and eight in high school, and the high school has now been adapted to be a life sciences course. For social studies, we have grade eight and grade 10 government. We also, in the alt assessments, test those same grade levels for ELA, math, and science, with the exception of science being a grade 11 due to the way that the curriculum is written for content instruction. For our English language learners, we begin using the Access for L's um, in kindergarten, and that's uh, some people would refer to it. The WIDA is the company, and we test all the way through grade 11, and we look at the different levels of language proficiency for listening, speaking, reading, and writing. And then for our early childhood students, this year is the first year that we've moved from survey to census for our KRA students. And we saw the importance of doing so because of the expansion of our early childhood and pre-K programs and being able to look at across our school system, how well our students are prepared for uh, the expectations of kindergarten. And then in addition to that, part of my role is to also follow those kids as they move into the primary grades and the intermediate grades to see if we are making improvements and keeping pace or exceeding pace or if there are certain uh, pauses we need to take and say hmm you know we seem to be losing ground um, and it may be for specific student groups as well which historically our map data has showed us that next slide please so when do we administer the mcap um, state mandated testing occurs throughout the school year. It's not just a spring assessment, along with certification and local assessments. So <clears throat> we provide MCAP assessment. Uh, there's a fall version for high school students, which actually happens in the winter, and that's for students that need extra opportunities to test for their graduation requirements in Algebra 1 and government. In addition to those assessments, we have our spring assessments for what we just had mentioned. The KRA is actually a fall assessment. <coughs> Excuse me for a moment. Thank you. And then in addition to those assessments that are considered state mandated assessments as shown in purple, uh, we have our um, measures of academic progress growth map assessments that we do three times a year for students that are in first and second grade that we do fall and winter for students who are in first through eighth grade and we do winter spring for students who are in kindergarten. 
All students in K through 12 participate in curriculum based assessments. Oftentimes they're referred to as periodic assessments or unit assessments, end of um, unit assessments for courses that include ELA, math, science, social studies and other subjects. Um, many of our students are involved in CTE programs and they have uh, certification exams as well as opportunities to demonstrate skills as they're working towards proficiency levels for not only certification but also for some students um, being prepared to then uh, transition from high school into apprenticeship programs. One of our staples in Baltimore County Public Schools that uh, we've been doing for about six years uh, is to look at opportunities for all students to participate in PSAT and SAT. These are critical uh, data points for us because just like MAP, they're the two data points that we've been using that haven't changed. And what I mean by that is that they're across a common scale. So when we look at system impact, you know, MAP and PSAT and SAT data will be some of the most important data that we have for longitudinal data or data that is looking in a lagging view. What's most important in this present time, though, is what we have highlighted here in gold, those curriculum based assessments, because that really provides for us that interaction between teaching and learning and how students are responding to the instruction being provided. It's closest to the moment and it's the most important data that we have as far as accelerating student learning based on providing more time and quality focused instruction. Teacher created assessments help us be successful in that area by identifying um, discrete points within those essential skills of a standard that a student may or may not be um, demonstrating uh, effective skills in. And from there, you know, it provides access to grade level content and curriculum in order for our students to continue that pathway of acceleration. Next slide, please. So all that being said, uh, we spent a lot of time testing and what we need to make sure that we're doing is using that data in a, in a useful way in a timely fashion, which is why I lean back into curriculum based assessments. You know, as a former principal of 13 years, you know, it was critical for us to be able to look at what's happening in real time with our students, as well as have that measuring stick of map and MCAP along the way just to make sure that, you know, in intervals of time we are moving our students forward and our focus areas for continuous improvement, we're hitting the mark. <clears throat> this year is, you know, a responsive year to the impact of a global pandemic. Um, MSDE, uh, in accordance with the requirements of the federal government, ESSA, must assess students on an annual basis in state standards. So in order for that to occur, because it did not happen last spring, we have something called the early fall assessments. They are a shortened version of what we consider MCAP um, for students in grades that would typically be tested. So we mentioned three through eight and 10 when we were talking about MCAP. Those students are being tested currently. Uh, tomorrow's the last day of, of the testing window in the grade that they were in in the 2020-2021 school year. So that means we're currently testing grades four through nine, as well as any student who was in Algebra 1 um, or any student that was in Algebra 2 or Geometry in middle school. Those MCAP assessments that we typically give to students are much more comprehensive than what we're receiving in the early fall assessment administration. The data that we're going to receive will be less comprehensive than what we've received in the past by proficiency levels, by a lack of scale score, and by sheer item analysis and types of items that are being scored. The early fall assessments will have much uh, less valuable data to provide to us at the student and the school level, but there is a gem that we can take away from this. It will help us to see the impact of our curriculum writing when we aggregate all of those data points, because as you gather more data, you get a, you get a more accurate picture of what's actually happening. The challenge is that you know, the, uh, the items are so few in number and they only include selected response items that a student will be um, evaluated as one of three proficiency levels based on 16 questions and, and that's not an appropriate 
you know, way to evaluate a student. So again, we go back to the curriculum based assessments and the teacher made assessments to look at progress and growth of students, but it will help inform us that as a system by grade level by course, how well how well are our students performing in specific standards and for us to then go back and reflect and say how was it taught you know what when will it be taught again you know what were the expectations of those standards and as our students are moving forward you know how are we going to be responsive in addressing those needs um, so that's just an overview of the early fall assessments again they do include all of what we would typically test in the spring including mcapla math algebra one geometry algebra two science for grades five and eight um, high school misa which again is the life sciences course and the dynamic learning maps which is for our students that are non diploma bound next slide please thank you so um, we shared a lot about what we do as far as our assessments outside of that most critical triangle of teaching learning and feedback which is what we do with teacher created assessments and curriculum based assessments. These are the assessments that we provide to our students that are a little bit more lagging in what they're evaluating. It's growth over time and it's grade level standards based achievement. As you can see, we have included what's happening in the fall and highlighted the new um, assessment of the early fall assessment that is a one and done assessment, but currently MSDE is discussing um, changes to Comar and legislation to incorporate additional testing for our students in kindergarten, grades one and grade two based on the fall of their next school year. So that would be students in grades one, two and three would have a shortened assessment from MSDE um, in the fall. They don't have a timeline for that or have given us a, a standardized blueprint for a testing map, but it is currently in discussions and something that we will be watching very carefully. Um, in addition to that, we're starting up our fall map testing, and then we begin the fall block of ELA 10 and Algebra 1, as shared previously, which are graduation requirements for high school students that need additional opportunities to test, and that's December to January. We then get into our winter's Dibbles assessments. Um, Dibbles is an opportunity for us to screen for phonemic awareness, phonological recoding, um, lexical access, nonsense word fluency, um, sound, letter sound correspondence, all those uh, basic building blocks of learning how to read. Um, for life sciences, you know, we begin our MISA and government assessments in January 10th through February 4th, and then move into our next cycle of those winter assessments for MAP K to 8, followed by MISA in grades 5 and 8, and then our full battery of MCAP assessments, then SAT day, our spring dibbles K in grade one to see over time how well our kids are making that transition in moving from phonemic awareness to phonological skills and fluency. Then our spring uh, MAP K-2 to assessment, an important component for us for looking at growth and achievement over time. And then finally moving into life sciences for MISA and government, social studies for grade eight, field testing, and our AP testing, uh, which is you know, the, one of our highest points of student rigor when it comes to course. And when we're looking at AP testing, we're really looking at preparing students to earn college level bearing credit at a three or greater score for their APs. Next slide, please. So that was a lot. <laughs> Um, but I really appreciate your time and attention and and wanting to get more information about MCAP. Um, now's an opportunity for us to um, slide back and forth with those slides and, and just have a conversation about um, any questions you may have related to the Maryland Comprehensive Assessment Program and its suite of assessments. Thank you so much. Um, we appreciate your presentation. Uh, it's a lot, so we of course are going to start with Ms. Mack. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur, for having this on the agenda, and Dr. Wisted and Dr. McComas and uh, Mr. Conley for putting this information together. My question is actually about MAP, and I know that that was on one of the slides, so do you mind if I ask a question about MAP? No, no, Ms. Mack, I always appreciate your question, so please. So it's my understanding that in previous years, um, MAP in the early grades have been categorized as either primary, 
there were two versions of math, primary or intermediate, and the primary version allowed teachers the flexibility to identify students who they thought might need some assistance with being the questions, not giving them the answers, but reading the questions to them. And given the fact that we're coming off of a pandemic, um, we're not even through it yet, I think um, you know, that our kids are in a very vulnerable place, but with the testing that looks like it started on October the 18th, I'm being told that teachers cannot choose the primary version, that they must choose the intermediate version, and that kids in second grade, for example, are just being told to do your best. And I have heard from three schools now that kids are actually like melting down because, and, and let's choose map math. You know, the kids may know the math part of it and having the ability for the teacher to read the questions in all the previous years has allowed that student to demonstrate his or her proficiency. But with this year saying that all teachers must use the intermediate version, kids who depended on that assistance from their teacher are not getting it. So my questions are, how was the decision made to do this? Is it a state or local decision? Um, I, I worry about the impact on the validity of our results from year to year. And because I believe there is an impact on the validity, I worry about the impact on SLOs that teachers create because they're making a prediction based on what they do as a teacher on how a student is going to perform. And with that significant change, I just wonder what, you know, I, I want to know what, how we got here and what the impact's going to be. Sure. So there, there's a lot that you had shared within that question. <laughs> I know. Um, and, and things that I, I believe require clarification. Um, so for MAP <clears throat> reading and MAP mathematics, there's a K to two assessment and a two through five assessment. It's always been that way. Right. Um, we have previously elected to use the K to two up right. until the 2019 school year um, for second grade students. It has the ability to um, read items for all students. What happens is as a child progresses through those items, the reading actually turns off what a child's skill level has um, exceeded you know, what the expectations were for that assessment. <clears throat> In May of 2019, NWEA came out with a research brief. Their research brief showed that more than 85% of the students that were in second grade taking the second grade test were not being assessed to the best of their assessment ability because the items were so few in number and those kids were testing out of the reading to begin with. And their recommendation to all NWEA clients who use the MAP assessment was to switch in May of 2019 from giving second graders the K to two assessment because it was too easy to to use the two through five assessment because it gave a greater range. They can incorporate more items that will go backwards in a student's profile than they could incorporate items that would move students forward. So what we saw if you look historically at map data is that we had a bubble. We had a grade two bubble for years and years and years that um, would look like from K to two, our students made a huge growth gain. And then in third grade made, made a dramatic collapse in data. And that bubble profile was not um, germane to just Baltimore County Public Schools. It was MAP users in general who were using the second grade students in a K-2 assessment platform rather than the two to five. So we have given exception for special schools, you know, to utilize those services. We do not have baseline data from the previous year to follow MAP's guidelines of a RIT score of less than or equal to 170. We'll be able to make decisions moving forward based on that cut score because we'll have map data and as far as slos the slos that teachers use are based on growth 
They're not based on the fall assessment. They're based on the results of the winter assessment. So the more growth that students show over time, the greater the uh, percentage of students within an SLO would be of meeting those marks. So there's a lot of different factors that come into this. I'd love to have a, a, a a lengthier conversation uh, when it's available to do so, but I don't want to be remiss and not uh, miss the mark on the purpose of being here for MCAP. Thank you, I appreciate no. that. I just wanted to make a point that I am worried about from the equity perspective. I have heard some teachers are just ignoring the guidance and they're reading to their students anyway, and I think that creates a, a perfect storm of inequity. And um, the other point is if we go back to ever using the map, um, the K2 through whatever the early one is, it will create um, some, I think, invalidity in the results. But I appreciate you uh, um, giving me an answer to that. I, I, am, I am concerned about it. Thank sure, you. So, let, so let me address um, you know, what I perceive as a misconception. Um, Teachers cannot read the MAP assessments to students unless they're doing a one-on-one -on -one assessment um, because each assessment is different. The items come up in different orders and it's responsive to how a student's responding. Students who receive 504 or IEP or EL accommodations would get a reader um, and that's available to them through those specialized programs. But one classroom teacher could not possibly read the, ass the assessment. It's not like a math unit test where it's scripted and it's question by question. So I just wanted to address that first. Um, second, we, uh, we're following the NWEA guidelines. So when we have students that perform below a 170 RIT score, then those students will move into the K-2 assessment model, which um, is part of their validity stranding. And NWE has lots of psychometricians and research studies to support the work that they do. And we've weighed this very carefully since it came out in May of 2019. Thank well, you. Thank you, Mr. Connolly. That's very helpful. Ms. Ms. Mack, uh, did that help you? I, I said thank you, but I was muted. <laughs> you're, you're quite Thank welcome. You. I appreciate your, your inquisitiveness and advocacy. Thank you. Um, Mr. Thomas and Ms. Mack um, and Ms. Pasture, uh, Mr. Offerman has already um, had to leave, but we have equity now. So if you have further questions, I would appreciate it if you would email them uh, to the appropriate person. I want to thank all of you uh, for just a wonderful um, meeting today. There was just such wonderful information shared today. So thank you so very much for the preparation. I'd like a, a motion now to adjourn. So move, Thomas. Thank you, Mr. Thomas. I have a second, thank please. You, thank you, Ms. Mack. And again, uh, we are adjourned, but thank you all for your presentations. If there are any questions, please email them to the appropriate person. Everyone have a great afternoon. You as well, thank you so much, all of you. Thank you. Thank you.